but an exciting time for television, what an exciting time for superheroes and comic book adaptations on television. You have your hands full. We so much to talk about. Um, let's start. You know, I want to start with the Freedom Fri Fighter okay, yeah. with the Ray. Cool. Uh, tell us a little bit where that's at, and then uh, let me geek out and talk to you about that. Okay, I love it. Well, you know, with the the four shows and now five shows with Black Lightning coming on in in January, um, clearly we don't have enough superhero shows from the CW. There's just not enough. So um, they were like, well, let's also do animated. Uh, you know, we'll do animated uh, superheroes. So we did Vixen, we did two seasons of Vixen uh, with Megalanie K voicing Vixen, and then they came to us and said, we still want more, and they pitched the Ray. And I was like, oh, that could be really, really cool. So what, uh, what, we, what we just premiered were the first, I think, three episodes. The next three episodes will be on next Friday. It's all streaming on the CW Seed. You can like get it online, the app, Apple TV, Roku, everything. And it's really awesome. What's exciting about it is it's the very first metahuman superhero, uh, and also the very first uh, superhero in a lead role that we've had who's gay uh, across all the shows. So that's really cool and exciting. And we've got Melissa Benoist uh, voicing Overgirl from Earth X. If you watch the Crisis on Earth X crossover, you know she's reprising her role there. Uh, Echo Kellum is back as Mr. Terrific. Um, Carlos Valdez is back as uh, Cisco. Megalini e. Kay is actually reprising her role as Vixen. So it's a nice little continuity in the Arrowverse. It's great. Well, you know, and the idea of having a gay character, tell me a little bit about going in. I mean, that's a huge opportunity and it's a huge challenge. It's got to be done right and it's got to be done in a thoughtful way. What are some of the compass points on that? It's, well, I'll tell you, for one thing, you know, don't write out of your lane. You know, don't write what you don't know. Um, so uh, I'm not gay, uh, but w I always do the CW Seed series with a whole group of writers. Uh, and one of the writers is Emilio Aldrich from Arrow, he's one of, uh, you know, the writers on Arrow, uh, so I brought him in. He was incredibly instrumental in just making sure that, you know, we were doing this in a correct way. Also, like, you know, not to spoil, you know, plot points, but the character is wrestling, when we meet him, we're, he's wrestling with whether or not to come out to his parents. And we wanted to tell that story not only uh, in obviously a sensitive and appropriate way, but also in a way that wasn't cliche. There's that, that's the coming out story, um, you know, has actually, you know, there's a lot of cliche ways of doing it. Um, and we wanted to avoid that. And I think we kind of thread the needle, which is, by the way, it's not easy in animation where the nuances of performance um, are, are harder to achieve in animated form. But, you know, I, I'm not objective, but I, I, I was very pleased with the end product. That's fantastic. And you would think um, uh, from a story perspective, uh, the coming out part would, that has a lot of uh, potential overlap with secret identity. I mean, the, every superhero has a secret identity and every gay person has a secret identity until they come out. That, that's exactly right. And, and in The Ray, we're also telling an origin story. So it's very much a, you know, he basically gets his powers, becomes a superhero at the same time when he's wrestling with coming out to his parents. So everything sort of intersects in, I, I hope, a very nuanced, really interesting way. Sure, that's great. And uh, Freedom Fighters, I remember uh, you, know, you and I have geeked out many times talking about comics, uh, but in the 70s uh, when uh, the Freedom Fighters came back in a big way in the DC universe and the comics, uh, those great costumes, I mean, Human Bomb and Un Uncle Sam and the Ray and oh, Doll I Man and love all of those them. characters. Love those characters. Uh, and they have such a long history uh, going all the way back to quality comics. That's it. Yeah. It's so, I mean, you, decades and decades and decades to the point where, you know, when DC and CW said, do you want to do the Ray? I was like, well, which one? Because yeah, exactly. there's, there's so many iterations and a lot of them are really That would different. be an array of Rays. Uh, well played. Sorry. Well played. Please. But uh, so what's the, a... the audience didn't groan, so it must, <laughs> yeah, have, been, it must have been an okay joke. They shrugged and winced, but yeah. no groans. Um, but you were saying, I'm oh, sorry. So, um, but what really excited all of us was the idea of doing the multiversity iteration of the Ray that uh, Grant Morrison invented for his multiversity series. Okay. Uh, and he sort of reinvented Earth X as, you know, uh, and, and reinvented the Freedom Fighters as a whole team of superheroes of oppressed minorities. Right. Which I thought, you know, it's Grant. Uh, of course, it's a great idea. And the ability to do that uh, in the animated series was really enticing. Yeah, especially if you're looking for a way to take characters that have their genesis in the Roosevelt era yeah, and yeah. look for a 21st century application, 21st century 
way to breathe life into them. What a what an amazing place to start. Just that that alone, that sentence that they're all from, uh, you know, outsider groups, of, yeah. uh, communities, that just makes it full of life right from the get-go. Yeah, it was it was incredibly uh, exciting, and it was one of the reasons why the series actually begins on Earth X with the Freedom Fighters in action. Like you you immediately meet them in the opening seconds, um, and you get to see all these you know, fun character dynamics and just cool characters that haven't been depicted in this form before. That's great. Um, there's so many things you were mentioning. Uh, television is overflowing with uh, superheroes these days. Uh, and let's talk about some of the other projects you're working on and, and uh, some of them are at some interesting turning points. Um, yeah. For instance, um, well, Arrow, tell us where we're at with a Arrow. Arrow, we just, um, we just aired our mid-season finale. Um, there was a couple of cliffhangers, a couple of reveals. Um, about two weeks ago for Thanksgiving, we, uh, I have to mention this, we, we did an episode of Arrow uh, where a rock concert is attacked, and it ha because we're here at Nassau Coliseum, it was a Billy Joel concert actually at Nassau Coliseum. We used Nassau Coliseum footage uh, from 2015. I'm guessing you had something to do with that decision? I might have had a little something to do with that, yeah. <laughs> um, I, 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 it's possible I micromanaged it. Like, I was like, okay, this is the song I want to use. This is the concert footage I think we can get. You know, it was very, very specific. And which songs? A, a Labor of Love. I haven't watched that one yet. Which songs were in it? Uh, no Man's Land. No. Uh, I wanted, I didn't want a greatest hit. I wanted an album track. And No Man's Land is a, I really love that song. I really love it in, in concert. It's really a great song live. And um, again, since we're here on Long Island, it's a song about Long Island. Uh, you know, it, particularly like this area of Long Island. So it, it just connects up. Yeah. Um, <laughs> strong Island. Um, so just very, it checked off so many boxes for me. Forget about it. <laughs> it was really cool. Really cool. Terrific. And then going down the list, what else we have? We have... Um, well, we've got uh, the second season of Troll Hunters cool. uh, premieres uh, next Friday, December 15. There's a small independent film that's also coming out that day. I, I'm not <laughs> sure, but I, I'm... So I'm suspecting a lot of people watch Troll Hunters on December 16. Uh, but uh, Mark Hamill... Uh, is in Troll Hunter season two. So if you're, you know, after you watch The Last Jedi, I, I think you're gonna see The Last Jedi first, but after you watch The Last Jedi, you know, come to Netflix and check out. We've got 13 really amazing episodes. It's fantastic. It's so great seeing Mark, uh, the success he's had in other genre uh, material beyond Star Wars. I mean, because obviously uh, he'll forever be an icon for being at the center of the Skywalker family and, and Jedi universe. But, you know, thinking about things he's done, for instance, one of my favorites is as the Joker on Batman the Animated oh, Series. I mean, totally. And this is the 25th anniversary, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, or 20th. It, it, people forget, like, how, what an incredible actor Mark is and what an incredible voice actor. Unbelievable. Um, and the Joker is, and I, I, there are, like, if, if his performance is like a fine wine, there are flavors of the Joker in his Troll Hunters performance. Nice. Uh, but, He's incredible, like, just watching him in the recording booth, the nuance that he's able to bring, and you, you can give the most slight adjustment, and he just nails it. Just, just calibrates. It. He just, it, he's a very finely calibrated instrument. Yeah, and also with him, like, I've always thought that, and, and I love Heath Ledger's performance as much as anyone. I love Cesar Romero's, you know, traditional different take, but Mark has the best laugh of he any does. Joker. He absolutely does. And this, he's, yeah, I mean, no, he's, it's Mark's true. amazing. He's incredibly talented. His Joker is like one for the ages. Yeah, and it's hard to laugh like that. It makes me it nervous, is. actually. It, it makes is. Me I know. Him. It's like, what, you gotta, gotta be careful with the throat there. No, I don't want him standing behind me. I think I, <laughs> I, I think he makes me nervous. I really yeah. do. Um, Okay, so going down the list. Oh, was, oh, we got, oh, Legends of Tomorrow. Oh, of course. Um, we just aired our mid-season finale there. It ended, uh, spoiler alert, with the surprise appearance of John Constantine, Matt Ryan reprising his role from the NBC show. Um, and Matt will be back for our mid-season premiere, episode 310. And I have to say that episode's amazing. Like, I, I would watch the Sarah Lance, John Constantine show like any day of the week. Those two guys are so great together. Absolutely. Um, and that's a, that's a real joy. And we'll be actually, we just announced that we're, we're time traveling again. We're moving time slots. We're gonna be in the Supergirl time slot for eight weeks starting in February. So uh, Monday's at eight, uh, which, which is cool. Spot. What? In the Metropolis spot. In the Metropolis spot, yeah. It's, it's, we're just right there, National City. Um, so it'll, it, actually, if you're a fan of the DC CW shows, it's really great because eight o'clock Mondays, 
you'll get like I think 23 continuous weeks of uninterrupted superhero television wow. in, in that time slot. So it's kind of cool. Yeah, it must be so exciting for you. Uh, you know, the water level raises all ships, and to see it the franchises across the board uh, setting a standard of quality and setting a standard of recognition of success, uh, it just must be very exciting. Like now, you 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 know you can double down on things. Yeah, we, we, we've, I think we've gotten the confidence under our belt, both creatively and production-wise, to just, there's really nothing we can envision that we don't feel like we can achieve on some level, and it's really exciting. And we, we, we just came off of our, our annual crossover, and this year was the biggest crossover we've ever done. We did all, you know, all four shows, four hours, um, and it was total insanity. It was, it was, it was very difficult, but it was also a lot of fun. Going into that, that massive crossover, and again, that speaks to the sensibility of all DC fans from the 70s. I remember those Justice League issues would be Justice Society and the Freedom Fighters and maybe the Legion of Superheroes and, you know, everybody shows up. Um, it's, it's complicated to do on a page. It must be mind-boggling to do it on a screen and with franchises that have all their own strings to to the threads to follow. It, it, it was def it's always a challenge, um, but what makes it fun is the fact that we grew up with those cross JLA, JSA crossovers, and they were, they were a huge influence, and they were a big influence on us this year because this year we were like, we want to do a classic multiverse, you know, crisis on blank yeah. kind of, you know, kind of story. Um, and, you, you know, we, you know, weaving all the threads together of all the different shows, that is, I think the part that makes it cool for me because it makes the crossover meaningful. Like this year we actually, you know, unlike in previous years where the crossover was kind of like you could, if you wanted to, you could skip over the crossover uh, and not really miss anything. This year there were major developments for each of the four shows embedded within the crossover. Um, and that was, that was cool. That made it meaningful in, a, in another way, another kind of way for us. Yeah. And, I, you know, obviously, this, I'm not even sure you can answer this question, but I'm sure you have a list either in your mind or in a locked computer file of characters you'd love to get to, you know, looking back through, you know, your Boana Beast oh, issues yeah. or your, you know, back to, you know, back to the early 60s, uh, the Showcase comics. Um, is there a couple that you can share, some, you know, a uh, dream? Oh, yeah, look, I mean, I, I've made no secret of the fact that uh, one day I would love to see the question on Arrow. I think the question is just, Taylor made for Arrow. I've always felt that. Um, you know, the, I will say, you know, it, it, we're now in the sixth year of, of doing these things, and what's amazing to me is all the characters that were on our bucket list, we've, we've seen, we've done a version of, and yeah. that's really, like, I've always wanted to get Vigilante on Arrow, and we did that last year, and, um, you know, but there's so many characters, and there, there's, there's a couple of other characters who are on my list. Every time I see Jeff Johns, you know, we're like, how about this character? How about that character? Um, but we've been really, really lucky. We've had a chance to, you know, even, even you know, name-checking people, like we name-checked Bruce Wayne for the first time, we yeah. name-checked the Mascara, um, and they've been, DC's been really kind with letting us be mischievous yeah. that way. Uh, they, they've, they've allowed us to put in our little fanboy Easter eggs. You know, I would think that uh, uh, the reflex, uh, you know, five, six, seven years ago, is that, well, we have the cinematic DC stuff, we have TV, and if they get too close and they bump against each other, it's gonna confuse people, we're gonna, people are gonna say, well, why does this happen? And what I think they've realized, I would think, and what fans have realized is that these are separate and discrete um, universes or experiences, and that, and that the fans are so sophisticated at this point that they don't expect everything to track all the way through, that they know that these are separate silos. They do, and I, you know, at the same time, it's like it's always a conversation. And like, what helps is, like, we don't we not only have a good relationship with DC, but there's a lot of people at DC who are just my friends. Who you know, we hang out, um, and it, you can just have that like very casual, like it's not a big corporate political thing. It's just like, hey, we want to do this, or this would be fun. Like, you know, like Bawana Beast uh, on episode 302 of Legends, like. I just knew going to the circus, we would have opportunities for Easter eggs. Yeah. So just called up, you know, DC and was like, give us a list of people who, you know, we could just felt, you know, have into the background. And then if you look really carefully, you'll see that there are gymnasts uh, who wear leotards that are green and yellow and red. And those might remind Great. you of certain other similarly uh, attired gymnasts. Flying. 
maybe, maybe families. Flying people, yeah. That don't do um, well. Yeah, you just never <laughs> potentially. Know. Um, so it's it, it's it's fun for us. I think it's fun for the fans to like watch the shows and be like, wait a second, that's Bawana Beast. Wait a, se wait a second, what did I see there? Yeah, and I don't think you have to worry about the Bawana Beast movie. Uh, You'd well, be surprised. No, you never know. No, actually, I don't think <laughs> no one's making the Bawana Beast movie soon, anytime soon. Let's put it that way. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, what fun! And looking back over the experiences that you've had, you know, we uh, we remember our successes, but we also remember our missteps and we remember our challenges better sometimes because they guide us. Uh, That's a Green Lantern question. No. <laughs> you can ask a Green Lantern question. I, I wasn't even thinking of that. That's no. funny. No, I was going to say. Um, in the creative process of the shows, you know, uh, is there a little moments where you look back and you go, oh, okay, you know what, this this was something that we learned. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. maybe an experience, something that was a corrective that you say, oh, okay, we, t we learned a lot from this, we learned to go this way. Totally. I mean, well, first of all, I will say this, I've been working in television for 18 years now, yeah. and there was not a single episode of anything I've ever been involved with that I haven't wanted to change at least one thing, you know. But I would say, um, overall, the I think probably like the biggest takeaway lessons we learned, um, like the, we're, during the first season of Arrow, like when we were very first doing this, and the learning curve was so steep, we learned we learned a few things. We learned, you know, don't. Um, this, this is maybe the two inside baseball uh, an, an answer, but. We, we had all these characters and all these actors and we made this point of like, every single character has to be in every single episode whether they belong there or not. Um, like a roll call. Like a roll call. And I was like, oh, you gotta name check Lance, gotta get Laurel in there, gotta get Tommy in there. And one of the things we, we realized was it kind of did a disservice to the individual episodes because we were just servicing, you know, actor contracts as opposed to really servicing the story. So one of the big things we did in Arrow season two, and we sort of, this is applied to across all the shows, is we're just telling the best story we can. And if a character appears, they appears. If they're in one scene, great. If they're in no scenes, fine. It's just, it's 23 episode seasons. There's, make each episode its own special thing and tell the story that needs to be told. And I think as a result, we actually ended up not only just doing better episodes and avoiding character moments that quite frankly were very forced or wedged in it, it, it elevated the the quality of the series uh, overall so like, that's one thing uh, we learned a lot of things production wise in terms of like how do we pull this off like you know we've learned what to do practically and what to do with cg um like i'll give you an example last year we did uh the you know invasion crossover and believe it or not, our original plan was to do practical aliens with like makeup and prosthetics and everything, um, and then just sort of supplement them with CG characters. And we realized very early on the process that that would, that would not be a good idea. So we actually went in and even removed some practical aliens and replaced them all with CG characters. Um, so it's like, so it's just like learning what's possible and what, you know, you have a whole array of tools at your disposal and picking the right tool for the right job is really tricky. I can see that because, you know, um, it, not reflexively, but uh, if you looked at something like the Starfleet shows for, ge yeah. uh, for generations, so yep. to speak, the, it was always, you know, let's change the head, eyebrows, let's right. change the head and, and the practical. But you guys have a different uh, toolbox and you have a different uh, level of technology and budget. Yeah, it's, I mean, the technology, things, we're doing things now that quite frankly, we couldn't have done at the beginning of the shows. Um, we're, we're doing things now that we couldn't have done two years ago. It's just the technology has moved at such a pace. Um, even look at like, you know, Gorilla Grodd, who, you know, premiered on Flash two years ago. And each year, if you, if you go and you look at the Gorilla Grodd episodes from, Fla you know, from Flash into Legends, you'll see Grodd gets better like uh, on legends like the the model keeps getting upgraded and uh if you look on legends like unlike flash where he was always either hidden in a shadowy environment or always was placed into an all cg environment we had him in the vietnam jungle you know with hard rays of sunlight hitting him and he still looked better than he's ever looked before because the technology just keeps getting improved and improved and improved that's great. Just to update everybody, because you know we're on the big jumbotron in the uh, in the showroom, so oh, everybody. Really? Oh, that's a little scary. So look down and wave to everybody. How do I look? You look, I look good. Okay? You look good. Okay. Uh, we're talking to Mark Guggenheim. I'm Jeff Boucher. This is Ace Comic Con. We're having a great time. Uh, we're going to take some questions from the audience, uh -huh. and I have a microphone over here. So if any of you folks would like to ask a question, I'd encourage you to remember that.
question does end in a question mark, so huh. no, uh, no uh, show proposals, no uh, pitches, no, no marriage proposals. Sorry. Uh, I'm already m happily married. Otherwise, <laughs> I would totally be fielding marriage proposals. <laughs> that, that would be okay. I guess a proposal is a question, so maybe I should I'd have yeah. to correct that. But uh, if any of you folks uh, want to find this microphone right over here, and uh, you can do that. Um, you were talking about uh, the checklist, the roll call, uh, and learning that you didn't need to have like everybody represented constantly in the show. You know, as a viewer, I, I actually now I can sense that because the the, the second and third season, the, sh the show seemed to have more air in it. Yeah. You, like moments. Yeah. It, it didn't feel as like like no, it, you have it, to do this this it, 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 a little more actorly. It was definitely a little more actorly. Um, you know, I think the first season of Arrow, like I had been coming off of this experience on Flash Forward, um, which was a show that sort of, it was a mythology heavy show that sort of, you know, came out in the shadow of Lost. And I would always say in the Arrow room, like Lost has worn out our welcome. Like Lost has worn out our welcome. Um, the audience is no longer as patient as they used to be. Yeah. Um, so we would just burn through story with this incredible abandon. Um, and I actually, you know, there's, there's pros and cons to that. I actually, for the most part, I, I think it's a pro, but like, that's the other like lesson, like Greg Berlanti and I did a show called Eli Stone, and Eli was always on the verge of cancellation. So we would burn through story on that show because we're like, well, we gotta tell the story now because we might not have another episode. We might not have another second season. Um, and we sort of like, you know what? Moving fast and burning through story, it, it, it can be a good thing if it's the right kind of show. Yeah, if the ideas merit and uh, if you're not skipping things. If, if you're not skipping. And like actually in the case of Arrow, it was also, we found ourselves doing uh, characters. Like we, we never thought we were gonna do Slade Wilson in the first season of Arrow. Like we knew we'd eventually get to him because we show him in like, like the second shot of the pilot. But um, we never thought we'd do Slade Wilson season one, we did Slade Wilson. Never thought we'd do The Huntress in season one, did The Huntress, Roy Harper. Like, by the end of season one, we were like, wow, all these characters, we're using all these characters that we didn't think we'd get to until like through season five. Right. So that's the other surprise. We've been introducing characters in a much more rapid clip. And that was, that was only season one. That was before the universe got expanded, you know, starting in season two. And not counting maybe supporting characters, but maybe characters like superheroes. Uh, how many characters do you think have been represented in these shows? Oh gosh. I mean, it's um, gotta be a big number at this point. It's a crazy number. It's a crazy number. Um, I, you know, it's funny, we haven't actually totaled it. Though Maya Manny, who is the costume designer for, for Arrow, uh, but she's also designed all the superhero costumes across all the shows. She has in her office basically walls covered with each of the, you know, costume designs for all the superheroes across all four shows. and it's. It is a daunting thing to see. It's That's like, amazing. Wow, this is unbelievable. Oh, you should tweet that or. or uh, yeah, I should. I, next, next time, uh, ne next time I'm up in Vancouver, I'll uh, I'll take a picture. That's great. So we're here at Ace Comic Con, and we have a question. How you doing, sir? Where are you from? I'm from Holbrook, right here in Long Island. Hi, Mark. Nice to see you. Hey, how you doing? Thanks for coming out. Uh, speaking of the big superheroes that have been on the show, it was interesting in su uh, season one of Supergirl the way you guys danced around Superman's presence on Earth. It was great to see you bring him in for season two. Is he going to be coming back at all? Um, you know, I don't work on Supergirl, and, and even if I did, that question would be above my pay grade. Oh, yeah. um, there's whole corporate things uh, that, that are, are, are a mystery even to the people who work on the shows. Because he was very good, and, and also oh, a lot of people amazing. said that he, he captured the essence of Superman's character a little bit better than they had been doing in the movies. I think so. Tyler's incredible, uh, and I know he loves playing the role, yeah. um, and who, who knows? We, we name-checked him in the crossover. Um, Talk to those people, get him back. Uh, yes, oh, for sure. Thank well, that, you. Thank you. That sounds like a yes, then. Uh, it's, I'm it's joking. A, <laughs> like, don't get me in trouble. I'm joking, I'm joking. Hey, how you doing, Flash? Uh, hi. What's your uh, name? Grant. Where are you from? Wait, is your name really Grant? Yes. That's funny. <laughs> That's pretty good. Uh, I was asking about Legends of Tomorrow. Okay. Uh, you guys like adding more diverse characters every season? Yes. Uh, in Arrow Season 3, you introduced Katana. Is yep. there any chance we could ever get her back on Legends? We talk about that all the time, actually. Um, we love Katana. We, we love, you know, we love the actress who plays her. Uh, Keto Shimizu, who's a writer on Arrow, who wrote a lot of the 
the Katana episodes of season three of Arrow is now a co-EP on Legends and has a great affection for that character, even more so than I do, and I have a lot of affection for the character. And uh, we're always talking about, um, you know, it, I w it's totally, totally in the offing, totally a possibility. It's always, it really is about two things when we're talking about bringing a character in. It's we got to have the right story and the actor has to be available. Um, you know, a lot of times, like, we've wanted different characters on different shows to come in and just the actor's not available because, like, you know, we wanted, to, I'll give you an example, like, uh, Colin Donnell, who plays Tommy Merlin, uh, he, you know, spoiler alert, he has a, ca you know, a, a, a cameo in this year's crossover. We really wanted him for last year's uh, crossover for the Arrow 100th episode. We really wanted, you know, Tommy to return, um, but he's a series regular on Chicago Med. So we couldn't make the schedule work out. So it's, it's we, need, we need the right story and we need the actor to be available because we tr really try to avoid recasting. Um, and I, I wouldn't want to, certainly wouldn't want to do that with Katana. Uh, she's one of, my, one of my favorite characters that we've done. All right, thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Grant. Hey, how you doing? What's your name? Hi, uh, Anthony from Oceanside here in Long Island. So I had a question basically, I guess, on Legends of Tomorrow. So whenever I see like a movie or a television show that has to do with time travel, I always thought it's really interesting. I just want to know your process in writing that. Is there like a whole big, you know, flow chart making sure everything is consistent and like the logic behind it? Uh, well, clearly not. Um, <laughs> I, I, in fact, you know, uh, I'll get to your question, but like in season one, uh, you know, in midway through the season, the writers would say to me, like, well, wouldn't this be violating this rule or wouldn't it be the vi this violating that rule? And I'm like, guys, have you seen what we've been doing? Like, anyone who's tuning in for these, to this show for the fidelity to rules of time travel, they're already gone. We, they we've go lost, to Flash? We lost, yeah, exactly. We lost <laughs> them a long time ago. Um, the process on Legends is, it's not dissimilar to the process on the other shows, which is we always start with, like, okay, What's the emotional journeys of the characters? You know, what did they experience last week? What are they dealing with this week? And then we try to come up with an idea that allows us to sort of delve into those emotional waters. Um, you know, so, and, and then because it's Legends, and Legends is sort of unique among the shows in terms of it's so zany and it deals with time travel, um, a lot of it's like, you know, just what's the craziest idea? Um, and sometimes we don't have a flow chart, but we do have like a whole board with like time periods and notions and like, you know, different things. So we always like, we'll sometimes go back to that board and go, oh, wait a second, we can do, you know, Elvis. We can do, you know, um, you know, uh, last week we did Bebo the God of War, which is tickle me Elmo time displaced to the time of the Vikings, <laughs> you know, but that, the reason we chose that is it, it lined up with this emotional story that we were telling about the team dealing with the death of Stein. Um, so it, it's, it's like marrying those things. Plus, which the other thing we always have to think about is you don't want to go from like the 1950s to the 1960s. We, you know, in, you know, we want to like try to jump around in time. So a lot of times we're influenced by, well, what time period did we just come from and what time period are we headed to? So you don't get too much repetition. Got it. Thank you. Thanks Thank a lot. You. We're getting a little tight on time, so what's your name? Hi, my name is Laura. Uh, good morning. Uh, hey, Laura. With the writing of the shows, how has it changed with what the actors bring to the characters? Um, great question. Uh, you know, I would say when you first start out, you're writing, you're writing the characters. You're just, you're hearing a voice in your head that is really just the character. But then over time, the voice you start to hear in your head is the voice of the actor. And you start writing, sometimes it's very conscious and sometimes it's very unconscious, but you start writing towards their strengths and away from their weaknesses. Um, but what's tricky, I will say, is, and it's, it's a good challenge, is that over, like, let's take Arrow as an example. We've been doing this for six years. There are, th you know, we've evolved as writers, but Steven has also evolved as an actor. So there are things we write for him now that we never would have written for him in season one. Um, because, you know, just in season one, like humor, like Steven has developed a, a real great gift for delivering like a, a, his timing, his, his delivery, his deadpanness. And I think he would tell you like, we weren't writing that stuff for him in season one. I don't think he would have been comfortable playing it in season one. So like, it's a, it's a symbiotic relationship where every day we get to Ellie's and we're seeing what they're doing and that's influencing our writing and our writing is pushing them in different directions and you go back and forth and back and forth. Thank you. you. Know, 
Thank you. Great question. I heard Norman Lear once say that it's a triangle between the writer, the performer, and the story. That's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. And and it's it's and great. It it's a shape. very symbiotic situation. It's, it's yeah. nice. Great question. How are yeah. you doing? Luke. I'm uh, Patrick Pollard. I wanted to know Hi. if Kid Flash, is he going to be replacing Firestorm on Legends in Tomorrow since... Oh, that's an interesting idea. Uh, I, I, I can tell you that I can't tell you who is replacing Firestorm. The only, uh, because we're, we'll make that announcement probably in the new year. Um, I will say that it's not a brand new character. It's a character sort of from, plucked from somewhere in the Arrowverse, uh, a, a character you've seen before. Um, okay. So stay tuned. All right. Sounds great. Great question. Thanks. How are you, sir? What's your name? My name's Randy. I'm from West Babylon. I was just wondering, in regard to costumes, how much is like the Batman or the Arrow costume really worth? Good question. Do you? Um, they cost. It's funny. I should know this because I have known this. Um, I would say the Arrow costume. It costs us about five thousand dollars to make. Right. So every time we need to do like a new costume, like sometimes they get damaged doing mm -hmm. stunts. Sometimes you know, like in season four, we you know created a brand new costume. It costs about five thousand wow. um, dollars. You know, and of course Maya's gonna see this and she's gonna text me or you know <laughs> be like, it's actually more than that. Um, <laughs> but I think it's around five grand. Okay, thank yeah. you. Got a few more questions. How you doing? What's your Hi. name? My name's Corey. I'm up in Smithtown. I right. want to know, with the new Titan show coming and the mention of uh, Bruce Wayne on Arrow today, is there any chance we'll see the Titan show in the Arrowverse? And if not, will we see any Arrowverse characters on the Titan show? Oh, a great question. Again, above my pay grade. The one thing, I, I will say this, the one thing I've learned is never say never. Um, there, I, I could not begin to tell you how often we say to each other, like, we never thought any of this was going to happen. We never thought we'd see all these characters. We never thought there'd be like a universe. Um, so I never say never, but in terms of like which characters can be on which shows and what's part of the universe above my pay grade and probably that's a good thing. Thank you. Cool, thanks. Uh, hey Flash, what's up? What's your name? I'm Kurt from Massapequa. Um, I was super excited about Long Gator Man on this season. I mean, one of my favorite characters you mentioned, I mean, even Wild Dog was like a total uh. random. But you mentioned the question, which I'm super psyched for, but Cord Industries has dropped a lot, so any chance, Booster Gold, Blue Beetle? Um, t you never know. Uh, I think, you know, it, I will say both those characters are characters we've talked about. Like, originally, Ray Palmer, who was introduced on Arrow, he was supposed to be Ted Cord, um, and we went another way. Like, so, you know, Booster and Blue Beetle, all the B characters, really, um, we you know, we're always talking about, uh, but nothing nothing I can uh, announce or speak to at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Fun, those are Charlton characters, right? Like, yeah, uh, and know, I Blue love Beetle those characters. And... Yeah. Uh, hi. Hey. So, is the reverse Flash gonna come back to be a main villain in the Flash, or? Um, I don't know, I don't work on Flash, I don't know what their, their plans are, um, but I do know that Tom Cavanaugh loves playing the reverse Flash, I mean, and we really enjoyed having him reprise that role in the crossover. Um, you never know. I mean, the, the, the great thing I, I think about all these shows and, and the characters and the actors really is we've, we've now got such a selection to play with that, you know, people can come back and they come back in different ways. You know, it wouldn't surprise me if you saw Matt Lesher back as Eobard Thawne at some point on one of those shows. That's, that's what makes it fun. That's all right, thank cool. you. Thanks, man. And we're talking to Mark Guggenheim. Welcome everybody again to today's Comic Con. Uh, we got a couple more questions, I think. How you doing? Hi, um, my name is Alex from New Jersey. Uh, I was wondering, do you feel that the scientific explanation for time travel for in the Flash gets more complicating or challenging? Um, you know, I don't know. It's it's. Uh, I think it probably does. I think I think the fact that we you know you got Flash doing time travel and Legends doing time travel. Um, and we, we we're not exactly consistent in our rules. Um, yeah, we, we're probably making, in general, making it all more complicated. Um, yeah. Yeah, just in uh, in season three, I felt like kind of confused with uh, with the whole flashpoint and then how that leads to like uh, Savitar and all that stuff. Yeah. Uh, did well, I, not I, his I, show, but. I, yeah, I don't. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know, but uh, I'll I'll I will I'll ask the Flash folks. Yeah. 
All right, thank you. Thanks. And the good thing about time travel, if you get it wrong, you just go back and do it over. That's the great thing about time travel. <laughs> How you doing? Um, do you think Supergirl will ever come to Earth Prime or like Earth One? As a, oh, like a move there, like permanently? Yeah. Oh, good question. Um, I don't know, uh, totally possible, totally possible. I think, uh, you know, that's up to the Supergirl folks and it would be a lot of sets to have to re reconceive and re reconstruct. All those sets exist on, you know, what I call Earth CBS, um, you know, but uh, you never know. And again, that's the, you know, that, that's, that's the nice thing. We, the fact that all these shows, knock on wood, they seem to have a life to them and will go on for many more seasons to come, it, it makes everything possible. It's such a okay. great toy box. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, how's it going? What's your name? Hi, I'm Carrie. Um, I was just wondering in um, Crisis on Earth X, we got to look at like Kara's dark side, but in the comic books, Lex Luthor brings out her like real dark side, and it's like the opposite of her. Do you think we would ever see that on Supergirl? I don't know. Again, it's like kind of up to the Supergirl folks, but I will say I think Melissa was amazing as Overgirl, and. Um, I think she enjoyed it. I don't want to speak for Melissa, but it, it seemed, watching the dailies, it seemed like she was really enjoying it, so you never know. Okay, thank cool. you. Thanks. It's such a rich universe, so many it, different it's ways. It's fun, yeah. We got time for one more question. What's your name? Hi, my name is Tristan. Um, back in season one of The Flash, you name drop Hal Jordan. Will we ever see a Green Lancer cameo in the future? Um, I don't know. I do, I will, I will direct your attention to Arrow episode 301, the season premiere of season three. Watch carefully in the uh, Coast City flashback. Thank you. Put a ring on it. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> just, you know. Exactly. exactly. We, we have to, we, we're very sensitive about Green Lantern over here in the Berlanti camp. Oh, so, yeah. um, well, you know, once bitten. Um, but uh, th that was fun to do. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Well, it's so good to see you. And let's run through yeah. again um, some of the upcoming dates that people should okay. keep an uh, eye on. Uh, the Ray uh, is on CW Seed right now. Uh, new episodes, I think, are coming out on Friday. 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 Um, again, very quiet day on Friday. Uh, new episodes of Troll Hunters out on Netflix on Friday. Um, every other Wednesday, uh, I also write X-Men Gold for Marvel. Uh -huh. And uh, every other Wednesday, you can pick up a new copy of X-Men Gold. Uh, Legends moving to Monday nights uh, starting in February. Arrow is on Thursday nights. Um, and we'll be back with our mid-season premiere in January, uh, which is pretty cool. Um, I will say, like, it's funny, I was reading some reviews online of the way the mid-season finale ended, and, you know, I don't want to spoil it for people who haven't watched it, but, like, I, a lot of reviews were like, it's, you know, eh, it's fine, but it's, we, we all know it's going to be temporary, so, you know, w big deal. And I'm like, you know, like, how do you know it's going to be temporary? <laughs> like, I, I, I don't think we're using the word temporary the same way. Um, so then we got that fun stuff coming up also. That sounds great. Well, it's always a treat to see this you. This is been, great, man. It's been too long since it I've seen you It's been way last. too long. Yeah, so yeah. And welcome out to Ace, and I'm glad we could do it in your favor. To, I know. Uh, it's just, I'm bro. really excited. Really excited. Cool. Awesome. Well, good All to right. see you. Thanks, man. Great Thank to you. see you. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, guys. Have fun today. Thanks.